Hello, my name is Joe Polizzi. I am the founder of the Content Marketing Institute and author of Epic Content Marketing. Super excited to have you here with me. I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes on the evolution of content, five elements to consider, another Schweiky Media fantastic webinar. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, my goal is that you get as much out of this presentation today as possible. Just a li little bit about what we do at the uh, Content Marketing Institute. We really try to help marketing side folks understand how to own their own media channels. So I know there's a lot of publishers listening to this as well. So we actually are teaching marketers on how to become publishers, but instead of monetizing that through what publishers normally do, uh, through advertising and paid content, they're trying to attract and retain new customers. And we do that through our education in a number of ways. Our big event every year is Content Marketing World, uh, September 2004, September of every year in Cleveland, Ohio, 8th or 11th in 2014 this year. Uh, Chief Content Officer Magazine is our every other month magazine, and then we do consulting with mostly Fortune 1000 companies from around the world and really just focus on education and training in content marketing. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, these five elements of content marketing, but just to give you a little bit preamble about what content marketing is, what's happening with it, why it's so critical. I think you'll get a lot out of this if you're just a marketer or a publisher. So either side will, will work for you. Just to take you back into a little bit of history, remember when the website was, when Al Gore created the Internet, remember we had the website, we had all this storage, and we had lots of places to put a lot of our content. A lot of people think of this as sort of the dawn of, of content marketing, where at first, though, we were talking about all our products and services. So most websites are just built for places to put our stuff. Uh, product and service information, we're going to put them up on the web and done, and then we really didn't think about, okay, how are we going to attract customers to really good content if we were on the marketer side? We basically just wanted to sell all of our stuff, product and service information. We would put PDFs up there, sales sheets, uh, feature benefit stuff. Then this thing called social media was generated. Uh, of course, we had blogs and wikis and video and forums and microblogging, and it was great because we could start putting our stuff in more places, right? But then we realized that we can't talk about ourselves if we're going to create audiences on these platforms. We actually have to talk about stuff that our customers actually care about. And But this was generally the philosophy that went to market. We have stuff that we want to sell. I call that corporate stuff. And we tried to, to turn that into customers, attract and retain customers in stuff, some way. The problem was is most of the stuff that companies were sharing – was about us and what we know is like cardinal rule of content marketing is customers don't care about us our products or our services and so we realized well what are we going to do we actually have to st start talking about stuff that our customers actually care about and that's when this thing called content marketing was really born by the way content marketing is hundreds of years old i like to talk about john deere the furrow magazine was launched in 1895 it's now the largest media platform in the farming industry 40 countries, 14 languages, 1.5 million circulation. So I don't want to make this sound as if it's new stuff, but on the web, it's a little bit newer than in, in the print, what we've historically seen as the print stuff. So we're moving to this content marketing model, and content marketing has been pretty, pretty good. So if we look at some of our research, and by the way, you can get to this research at bit.ly.com slash cm-research to get all the research. We've been doing it for the last five years. And we found out that 9 out of 10 businesses use content marketing in some way. So this is really good. This makes me happy. I'm, I'm really, really happy about that. I'm the content marketing evangelist. I want to see more of that happen. Unfortunately, this makes me sad. We do the same study. Just 40% believe their content marketing is effective. And that's if we look at B2B, business to consumer, nonprofit. It's right between 30 and 40% is the effectiveness. So if we have 9 out of 10 using it in some way, this is great, but only 4 out of 10 is effective, that's a problem. We've got a big, big problem because a lot of people, and this is what we're going to talk about the rest of the presentation, we're just not doing it right. We're not, and we're not, we're all media companies now, we are all publishers, but we've got to start actually thinking like publishers and creating strategies around this to make it work. And I always ask this question, and even you publishers, if you're trying to sell content marketing services, if you're trying to sell other things besides advertising and paid content, you have to think about what is your content marketing strategy. And if we think about whether or not you have something documented, some kind of a documented content marketing strategy, most companies don't. 
uh, way less than 30% of any size company has some kind of a content marketing strategy. So let's go back to the beginning example where we talk about all this content being shared in social, being shared on the website. We're just throwing out all this content, making clutter where there doesn't need to be clutter. We're, we don't even know why we're doing that. So that kind of kicks off with what we're first going to talk about with the element and getting into this is what the real strategy should be. How do we take all that corporate information, the stuff that we actually have to sell, how do we connect it with content marketing in order to get more customers on the back end? So that's really what we want to think about with content marketing. And just the level set from a definition standpoint, let's start here. Just so, we, I mean, you all have a different definition of what content marketing is. It's a relatively new term, really didn't come out uh, and start being used significantly till 2008, 2009. Content marketing is the idea that I'm going to create valuable, compelling and relevant content on a consistent basis, very important, in order to attract and retain customers and create some kind of a behavior change. The most important thing, just like you publishers know this, uh, consistency is key. We want to make sure that we're consistent, we're like just like a newspaper. You don't send something out and say, oh, I'm going to deliver the magazine on Thursday, and then I'm not going to deliver it again until Monday, and then maybe I'll do it again the, in two weeks. That's how most businesses behave. We're not consistent. If you were to ask me, Joe, why do most content marketing programs fail, I would absolutely tell you the reason why is because they stop or they're inconsistent. So what we want to do is instead of looking at the traditional media model is we're creating content in order to monetize that through, create that audience and monetize that through advertising or paid content. If you are a corporation that has products or services to sell, we're creating this type of a content to create an audience, to generate trust, and credibility so that down the line we can sell product services. There's no direct sales information in the content marketing. That's the key. We've got to make sure the sales resides outside of the content, and that's another area where people go wrong with it. So I'm going to talk about for the next 20 or so minutes is really get into what I would consider five important elements as we've seen this evolution of content marketing. And depending on whether you're beginner or advanced, I have a feeling that you're going to get something out of this presentation that's going to really make a difference. So the first element is what I call sales, savings, or sunshine. Sales, savings, and sunshine. There's only three reasons why we're going to do any kind of a content marketing program. Are we generating sales from it? Are we doing it in, instead of another initiative in order to save money? Or are we doing what we call sunshine? Are we creating happier customers? more loyal customers, keeping our customers longer, helping them buy more stuff at the end of the day, sales saving sunshine, one of those three things. Let me give you three examples of this working. Number one is Copyblogger. If you've ever been to Copyblogger, you go to their blog site and it will look something like this. Uh, how best-selling author C.J. Lyons writes. So if you, you, look at the, you look at the website itself and you say, wow, these people, it's like a media site for copywriting. And that's what most people actually think. But what, if, you, if you get in and you dig a little deeper, you'll realize that Copyblogger is not a media company. Copyblogger is a software technology company, and they generate the majority of their revenue from their 200,000-plus subscribers. So how this works is Copyblogger goes out. They create ongoing, amazing content. They get those people to opt in to sign up to their email newsletter in some way or their blog in some way. And then down the road, after they built a relationship with them, they end up selling stuff to them. And the stuff that they sell is SEO tools, WordPress templates, uh, and anything to help your content be found on the web. But they don't talk about that in their content. So that's really, really critical. So I just want that's an idea of I'm going to generate sales from my content. Here's a cost savings case study. This is Yuska Bank. Yuska Bank is one of the largest banks in Denmark. And they were like most banks. They wanted to do sponsorships. And, of course, we just finished with the World Cup. And one of the big things in Denmark is around football. So as a bank, they want to sponsor and get their name out in front of all these football fans. Well, traditionally, that cost them millions and millions of dollars. And they thought, well, we don't want to pay for all that. We don't want to have to rent somebody else's audience and pay to distract them all the time. How do we not have to pay for that sponsorship but still be involved somehow? So they created Yuska Bank TV, and this is a little behind the scenes. And if you go back and look at Yuska Bank TV and you look at this is actually in their bank, and their tagline is really funny. They actually say that they 
are the only media company with its own bank, which I think is kind of funny. So they actually think of themselves as a media company. They have a state-of-the-art studio. They've developed an audience and content programming at part of Yuska Bank TV that has attracted uh, tens and thousands of people to their site. So what's happened is those same organizers of those football and sporting events that used to make Yuska Bank pay are now saying, oh, Yuska Bank TV, would you come in and would you be a media sponsor and would you come in for free and would you cover our event? And that's something. So instead of paying the millions of dollars that they were paying, because they have an audience, because they have these content processes in place, they're able to not pay for this and get exposure um, for generally free because they have an audience, because they've targeted this audience. So it's a really good example. And, of course, we talked about this already. John Deere, the Furrow Magazine, this is a really good example of what we would call sunshine, um, keeping customers retained, keeping customers loyal in some way, started in 1895. Uh, the 1897 version is there on the far right, and then we've got the newer versions in digital and print. Um, 40 countries, 14 different languages, 1.5 million in distribution. That is the largest media operation in the farming industry, and they're not even a media company. So that's what I think that all of us should aspire to. How do we become the leading informational experts in our industry, no matter what that industry niche is? And that's what John Deere has been able to do. So those are the three things, and very simple, right? Sort of like marketing 101. But I like to throw this out there because so many companies say, I want to start a blog. I want to be on Facebook. I want to do Twitter. I want to do LinkedIn. And or they want to do a webinar series, or they want to do eBooks, and they don't think about what is the bottom line for goals in making this happen. So any one of the goals that you have has to flow up into, is it driving sales, is it saving costs, or is it keeping my customers happier in some way? So that's the starting line as element one. And I'll just share this quick example because I think it's interesting. I was doing a presentation in Columbus, Ohio, and the chief marketing officer of a fairly large um, gas station chain was in the audience. And she was saying, Joe, I really, you know, I really like this whole content marketing thing. I'd like to use this in, as part of our Facebook program. And she said, we have about 40,000 people that like our Facebook page and the fan us on Facebook, but we've sort of plateaued. And we haven't been able to grow Facebook fans. I said, what can we do in content to change that? And I said, that's a really good question. I'm definitely going to answer that. I said, but you have to answer a question for me first. And she said, what? I said, well, why are you on Facebook? And total silence. And by the way, this is a lot of companies that don't actually know why they are on Facebook. And that's what we have to figure out because I, I don't know how to help you. I don't even know if it makes any sense for people to like you on Facebook or whether or not you should be on Facebook or LinkedIn or have a blog or anything unless we understand what that why is. Why are we doing it in the first place? Now, I know this company because I'm a customer of their company, and I said flat out, you have an amazing loyalty program. Wouldn't it make sense to integrate your loyalty program with your Facebook page since most people that are going to like your Facebook page are probably current customers? This is not a lead generation activity for you. So thinking about it from that perspective, that's why I just want to get you in and, and think about some of the things you can do to make this change in your organization. So this is a little exercise that you can do at any time. I want you to create, get a piece of paper out, put the piece of paper down, and put why question mark at the top of the page. And then along the left-hand side of the page, I want you to list all the ways that you're creating and distributing content. Website, blog, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, webinar series, whatever. List the average company has about 14 or 15 of these. So list them all down the left-hand side of the page. And I want you to put why from that business, that sales savings to sunshine standpoint, why you're doing each one of these. And by the way, I've done this exercise dozens of times, and not one company has been able to clearly articulate the why for every one of these channels. So if you don't know, that's fine, but at least that will make you go back and say, oh, why are we doing that e-newsletter? Why are we doing that in-person event? What's, at the end of the day, yeah, we want to generate more sales. We want to keep customers. Well, why are we doing that? How are we measuring that? Does it make sense to keep doing that? Why are we on Facebook? Why are we on LinkedIn? Those types of questions are really important back to basics because as we went back to the beginning of the presentation, it's so easy for us to create content now. Sometimes we just think we have to be out there in all these channels. And the answer is no, you don't. 
We want to be in the right channels with the right message at the right time, and sometimes less is more. So in a lot of cases, you may, as you go through this process, you may decide, well, maybe we don't need to do that podcast anymore. Maybe we don't need to do those ongoing monthly PDF white papers that nobody engages in at all. Uh, maybe we want to put our attention to things that are going to make more of a difference in our customers' lives. So that's element one. So that's just the basics of getting there. So now we're going to go to element two, which is to create your content marketing mission statement. Now, you publishers know this really well, is the first thing, one of the first things you start when you launch a publishing property, a media property, is the editorial mission statement. What's one thing that brands never do when they're launching a content marketing strategy, and they never do a content marketing mission statement. So this is one of the things, and I harp on this all the time, that if you're going to do content marketing in any way, you better get your strategy set, and part of that is doing a content marketing mission statement. Let me give you some examples of some brands that are doing this. So this is HomemadeSimple.com. If you look at it, you might say, oh, this, uh, this looks like a Meredith site or Better Homes and Gardens or um, maybe Martha Stewart. This is actually Procter & Gamble's site. Procter & Gamble has been doing this site, Homemade Simple, since 2003, last we checked. And they have at least 6 million people signed up to get regular updates from this site. How would you like that? It's marketing so good it doesn't seem like marketing. People are signing up to get the latest recipes, organizational tips for the home, and that's really what they're focused on. And they started with a content marketing mission statement. And here it is enabling women to have more quality time with their families. Well, why is this so important? Because let's put it, let's look at some of the content, right? Let's look at a recipe. You're not going to see any six-hour recipes on this site because it doesn't go to the mission of the media property, right? Because we want to have women have more quality time with their families. You're not going to see anything to me on there because it's not targeting me. So these are the things we want to keep in mind, and we want to get this to every content contributor in our organization and make sure they know this. So if you create a brief or you go and say, hey, I need you know, a weekly blog post or a daily blog post for our site, you've got to make sure they understand what the mission is, and it will help you so much with resources and time on the editing side if they really understand this and what this is. So let's use a business-to-business -business example. This is Indium Corporation. Indium has been blogging since 2005. They have 17 engineers, mind you, that blog on a regular basis for on the Indian blog site. And when they launched this, by the way, very, very tough to get engineers to write, right? It's, it's, it's not the easiest thing to do, which is why they assign an editor, or content marketing manager, to work with those writers and make sure that they could meet the deadlines, make sure that they could write in a way that made sense for the audience. But, that's, but the experts in their organization are engineers, so that's who they focused on. Well, they started with a content marketing mission statement, and here it is. Helping engineers answer the most challenging industrial soldering questions. So let's break this apart. It's engineers, we're not talking about plant managers or CFOs. Uh, what are we doing? We're answering the most challenging industrial soldering questions. We're not answering questions about ball bearings or siding. Very specific to that. Because what does this do? It helps them become the leading expert over that particular content niche. And that's what we really want to do with our epic content marketing is really figure out how do we become the leading expert so that we can build an audience around this. By the way, side note, when they launched this program, leads in the first 18 months went up like 600% qualified leads. It's completely transformed the company. This has become one of the core parts of Indium's overall uh, content marketing program. So let's use an example from a media company just so, and then we want to do this for ourselves, this content marketing mission statement. So let's look at Inc. If you're not familiar, Inc. is a magazine for small business owners and entrepreneurs. So if we look at, okay, here is Inc.'s content marketing editorial mission statement in this case. They go, you go to their About Us page, you'll find it. It says, welcome to Inc.com, the place where entrepreneurs and business owners can find useful information, insights, resources, and inspiration for running and growing their businesses. There's three parts that you, to create your content marketing mission statement, you need to do. First, what is your core target audience? On the marketing side, we call this a persona. Many of us have six to nine different personas or audiences that we target it depend on what our products and services are. You've got to make sure that if you're doing a content marketing mission statement, it goes to one persona. Inc. puts their entrepreneurs and business owners in one persona. They have pain points and needs, very similar. They're going to put those in the same bucket. 
So that's the core audience. What are we going to deliver? Useful information, right? You don't see ink in ink content. They're not talking about, oh, sign up for our events. Sign up for, you know, please advertise in our magazine. No, that's outside of the content. The content itself needs to be pure, so you have to keep all sales material out of the content. Number three, the most important one, is outcome. Inspiration for running and growing their businesses. If you read a piece of ink content, Everything, the outcome that you get is, as a business owner, how can you be more profitable or how can you grow revenues? That's it. So you have to figure out for your content marketing program, how are you going to deliver this outcome in every piece of content? It's actually very helpful if you have an editorial calendar to add an outcome uh, part of the spreadsheet so that as you're going through it, it's like, oh, okay, here's the title, here's who's going to write it, here's when it's due, what's the outcome? and really focus on that so everybody it sort of drives into, here's what we're trying to do for our audience. So this is, you know, when you get a chance, not right now, but as, after you've let this digest a little bit, I want you to create your own mission statement. Remember, define your audience, what are you going to deliver, and then what is the outcome going to be. 99% of all businesses don't have this, and I believe that is one of the reasons why effectiveness is so low. So I really want you to focus on doing this mission statement. Three more elements. Number three element is don't build your content ship on rented land. And I've seen this all the time. And if we look at what's happened with Facebook, and I'm just going to pick on Starbucks here for a second. Starbucks has 36 million people liking their page on Starbucks. They've spent millions of dollars getting people to like their Facebook page. If you've seen what's happened recently with the Facebook algorithm, uh, what we know is 5% or less of organic posts make it to people that have actually connected with that brand. So that means that 95% of this audience will never see those posts coming through. And that's a tragedy because Starbucks has built this audience on Facebook. They built this amazing value, but they don't own it. They've been building this ship on rented land all along. So this is a problem. Same thing for Google+. Plus. So as Facebook's been changing their algorithm, Google Plus is a mess. They've lost their leadership team. We don't even know what's going to happen with Google Plus. So the, the thing is, is that as a media company, you'd use these. If you have a media company mentality, you use these channels in order to get people to sign up for the, the things that you want them to sign up for, You're to build your audio, your own audience, but you'd never put all your eggs in one basket, and a lot of these companies have. So I want to make sure that you start looking at other opportunities. I'll give you an example for LinkedIn. So LinkedIn just opened their publishing platform. I think that everyone should absolutely look at, link, look at LinkedIn. But for me personally, I don't care necessarily about the number of people following me on LinkedIn. What I want is I want to focus on really compelling content to the target audience I'm trying to have resonate with the content I'm creating. But ultimately, I want them to go back to my website and sign up for our e-newsletter where we have some control over that audience. So if that makes sense, I want you to start thinking about using social in that way. So really what we want to do is we're focusing on subscribers as a key metric. Really important. Just like we've done for years in circulation business, we focus on the audience. That is the value. That's how we're going to figure out where the value is and how ultimately our content marketing program is working or not, right? So Copyblogger, 200,000 subscribers. They get those people then to sign up. That's where 99% of their revenue comes from, so that works for them. Food and Family Magazine, 1.5 million paid circulation, believe it or not, on Kraft Foods, Food and Family Magazine. makes a huge difference for them. They actually launch new products and services based off the data that they get from craftrecipes.com associated with Food and Family Magazine. I love this example, Think Money Magazine. Think Money Magazine from Ameritrade, TD Ameritrade. Uh, this goes to active traders of stocks and derivatives. So these are active, active folks that really do this for a living. What they found out is that people who subscribe and receive this magazine trade five times as much as those that don't. And if I'm a marketing person, publisher, business owner, that's all I need to know. That's a game changer, folks. So that's what we have to figure out. So we have to start asking ourselves this question. What's the difference between those who subscribe to my content and those that don't? And even publishers are not necessarily great about figuring this out. So what I want to start doing is if I can get that database and understand who signed up for my content, and then I can overlay that with my customer database and people who are buying the stuff I want them to buy, I can start seeing 
who subscribed, what's the difference, what's the behavior, how long does it take them to subscribe, and try to figure out what is that holy grail metric that's going to make the most sense for me, which I think the best place to start is the opt-in email subscriber. Email gets a lot of rap these days. I think that email is still the best one. Might change tomorrow, but right now email is the one I would be putting most of my focus on. Got two more here to go through and then we'll, we'll end up. Number four, I've talked about this before, but I think it's critical because a lot of you are going out and create, create a ton of content, but you may not necessarily have the audience for that content. So what I want you to look at is to create an influencer strategy to help you build an audience. And I'm gonna use, this is a case study that uh, we, we did this at Content Marketing Institute, and if this is helpful and you can steal this methodology, please, by all means, do this. So a lot of people say they work with influencers, but I rarely see a lot of people that actually have a strategy in relation to creating an audience around content creation and distribution. So let me give you an example. So this is what you're seeing in front of you. This is our influencer hit list. An influencer hit list to me is, where are my customers hanging out when they're not on my site? And these are my top 10, you know, Jay Baer, Convince and Convert, Lee Oden, a top brand blog, Brian Solis, uh, Valerio Maltoni, a conversation agent. These are the people that my customers were hanging out and I looked at things like Google Alerts, through uh, Twitter hashtags, uh, things, uh, sites like Alexa. If you have a social media management tool or reputation tool, you can use sites like Clout to get some of that if that's helpful. You can also use sites like littlebird.com can give you some good, uh, that's littlebird.com that can give you some good data on where your customers are hanging out or who's talking about the type of topics that you that is your content niche. So first we get these and then we do this little formula called Social Media 411. And let's just use Twitter as the example so you can understand where I'm going with this and how we use this. So let's say that every day we're, we tweet out six original tweets. So that's four plus one plus one, there's our six. So let's start from the right. The first one can be a sales tweet. You have a coupon, you won customer service award of the year, you could talk about your products and services, that's fine, most people don't care but you get the product marketing service service people off your butt and they won't bother you for a while and great, you get that off your chest, that's a sales tweet. The one in the middle, that's your own content marketing, your own educational or how-to blog, your own webinar, your own um, ebook, your own podcast, whatever the case is. And then the four on the left, those are influencer posts. Those are very relevant to your audience, to your content marketing mission, but they're not coming from you, they're coming from influencers. And you're sharing this, and when you share it, you tag those people so that they're aware that you're sharing their content. So as an example, we have, oh, how to go all in with content marketing. Eight experts weigh in. So we're actually tagging three of them, Arnie K., John Wilbin, and Casey G. So that those people, they note that, and their influencers are probably paying attention. The thing is, if you only do this once or twice, they're not going to care. You're not going to build a relationship with them. Most people go to influencers and they put together a list like this and then they reach out to them in email and say, oh, we've identified you as an influencer. Would you please do X, Y, Z for me? They're going to absolutely not. They're going to think of you as spam. But you can reach out to them after a month of doing this. So if I share John Wilbin's content for the next month and every day I'm sharing a piece of content from him, he's going to know who we are and he's going to be very receptive when we reach out to him and ask him for something. But not yet. So first we're going to do the social media 411 and we're going to do this for a month or so and we're going to be very consistent about it. And then we're going to bake those people into our content. So here's another example. So we did that 411 and then we did the content marketing playbook which had about 42 case studies around content marketing. Well, 26 of those 42 we took from those influencers. We noted them and we said, hey, you know, get this really great case study on XYZ from Jay Bear, Convince and Convert. Uh, put it on page nine with a link to Jay's site. Well, Jay likes links to his site. He likes more people going to his site so that when I let Jay know, one of our influencers, that we actually promoted his information in our playbook, Jay was pretty happy. Jay's so happy that he ends up sharing it with his audience. So of those 26 influencers that we embedded into this program, 24 of those shared it out with our audience and we were able to get 50,000 plus downloads on this fairly quickly with an audience of less than 3,000. So this is really, really critical. So we're trying to create an audience for an ebook. We didn't have a large enough audience 
what we thought was a large enough audience of 3,000. We wanted more, so what did we end up doing? We ended up leveraging our influencers to create an audience, but that can't stop there. We have to continue to go on because we want to make sure that we get those people signing up for our stuff and we can actually one-on-one -on -one have that information um, so that we can communicate with that audience because most of the people that will come to our site will never come back again, and we want those people to sign up. So we end up, they go to our website. Let's say they're going to get that download, that playbook. We have one of our influencers sharing a piece of content or whatever. They get to our site, and there it is. Our goal is social proof. Hey, join over 70,000 of your peers. Get these daily articles, this fantastic content, and sign up for this documented content marketing strategy for free. So give them something really amazing so they sign up because it's a value exchange. And if the value is right, they'll sign up. If it's not, they won't. If it's really, really good information. So that's one. But we weren't getting enough people to sign up through just that. We weren't, let's say, distracting enough people with our amazing content offer. So we ended up using something like this. So this is a popover. I know what you're thinking. You don't like popovers. You're not into them. Um, you, you don't like them as all well as users. And I agree. I don't like them as users either. But what we found from this one is over 60% of our daily signups, we get about 100 to 120 people signing up a day. And uh, about 60% of those come through this form. So I can't hate it that much as a content marketer. I love this, actually. So it works really, really well. We want to figure out this is our number one subscription generation source, and this is how we can leverage influencers to get that, to get the traffic, get new people coming to our site, expand our audience, and then make them our own audience. We also use SlideShare. If you're not familiar with SlideShare, SlideShare is owned by LinkedIn. It's like the power. Um, it's like YouTube for PowerPoint presentations is the best way to think about it. And you could do the same thing. Here's an, my, my book came out, Epic Content Marketing. We did a slideshow on it. We put it up on the site as they get to one of the slides, there's a pop-up there. Um, they could click off of that if they don't want to. If they don't want to see it, they can go through the presentation, we give it away for free. Or they can say, yeah, I want. you want more information like this? Get it for free at Content Marketing Institute. Or you could not use the pop-over and click the Save button, and the Save button will say, hey, you can save this, you can download this presentation, but we would like to sign you for our e-newsletter. So you got to ask them for the sale when it comes to really, really good content. And that's what I think that you should do if you're going to make this thing work. Really quickly, this last one. Thanks for uh, staying with me on this whole thing. And I really think this is a big opportunity, is the buy or build scenario. And I've never seen anything like this before. I think you can go ahead and absolutely build your content marketing program like we're talking about. But there's also an opportunity for buying. You put that influencer list together. That influencer list is filled with individual bloggers filled with media companies filled with associations what do they have they all have subscribers sometimes that subscriber list that media platform may be worth purchasing instead of having to build it from scratch let me give you an example jpg magazine this is years ago jpg magazine was going bankrupt they didn't they weren't getting enough advertising they didn't know what to do what are we going to do and they said okay we're going to have to go bankrupt and we're looking for a buyer nobody would buy them but then an investing group led by Adorama ended up buying them. So let's put this into perspective. JPG Magazine is an enthusiast photography magazine online media platform. If you see it by the note, it says 292,000 photographers. That's their audience. Amazing, right? Adorama, they sell photography supplies to enthusiasts. Who are they targeting? JPG, custom, or JPG subscribers. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? And that's exactly why Adorama came to the table. Uh, the same thing you saw Makeup.com years ago. L'Oreal bought Makeup.com, and they've been leveraging that like crazy. So there's an opportunity there. Uh, Google bought uh, Frommer's Magazine, bought Zagat years ago. Um, if you think about that from a subscription and a branding standpoint, I think you're going to see, see more and more of this. So what I'm saying is that there might be an opportunity out right there be because a lot of bloggers have really, really – good subscriber networks, but they don't know how to monetize that, maybe you can come in and help them monetize it or use that for your own content marketing. And all that work that I showed you that we've done with that 411, maybe you could, if you have some excess capital lying around, you might see that as an opportunity. So in conclusion, here's my takeaways. First of all, set your goals for sales, savings, or sunshine. Got to be one of them. And then do that program. Why are you using each channel? And really, really focus on what the reader's outcome is. 
for everyone. When you're going through that content marketing mission statement, I really want you to focus on that outcome portion. Don't build your content ship on rented land. There's no problem using social media, but I want you to use look at the subscribers as the key metric for you. And if you don't have an audience, look at building an influencer list and doing that organically. Then bake those influencers into your content. And then once you do that and you get enough traffic, then you can create an engine to get and keep subscribers. And my flyer is consider buying if there's an opportunity, which I think right now is ripe for a lot of those blogs that have created amazing, loyal subscribers that haven't been able to monetize their platforms yet. So thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to me at joe at contentinstitute.com. I'm at Joe Polizzi on Twitter. Uh, the, the book is Epic Content Marketing. Uh, we go through all this and more, so if you really want to deep dive into content marketing and what we're talking about today, please check it out at Epic Content Marketing. Thanks to the good folks at Schweike uh, for having these wonderful educational webinars. Uh, I hope it's been of value to you, and have a great day.